Well, Marta Kristen, this is a joy. I am so happy to see you. My pleasure. I'm happy to see you as well. You bring such joy. You really do. And do you know what? I think even your most dedicated fans would have no idea just how absolutely extraordinary your life story has been. I mean, to sum it up, from being orphaned in Norway to Hollywood star, TV icon. I mean, you must pinch yourself thinking about it. It's really true. I, I, in fact, I was telling someone um, the other day, uh, they had asked me where I was from, and I said, well, I'm from Norway. And they said, oh, how did you get here? And I started telling them my story. They were astounded that, um, that I ended up here in Los Angeles, Hollywood, and uh, in, in film, and they said it, it's an absolutely stunning story and that you should tell it. And here I am telling you. Take me back to your early years. Now, your mum was Finnish. Your father was a German soldier. I think that's right. Uh, it was 1945. You were born. The war is wrapping up. You were put into an orphanage. My mother, who was Finnish, uh, was impregnated by uh, her lover, a German soldier, and um, a pilot, actually. And uh, she was ordered by her boss, who was a German officer, to uh, go to uh, Norway with him to continue being his assistant. And um, so she was afraid, she knew she was pregnant with me and was terrified that he would kill her and me, of course, um, if, if he found out. So she did go. She was a very petite woman and uh, she completely, she wore large clothing and, and hid her pregnancy. This is so astounding to me. Um, and then uh, a, fr a friend of hers also came with her and uh, her best friend. And she birthed me in her, in her room. And, uh, and immediately her, she and her friend took me to, uh, uh, I, I think it was like an underground hospital mm -hmm. because uh, it was during the time when um, you know the the Germans uh, the Nazis were taking children that were of my like you know blonde blue eyed and uh, putting them into uh, what, what, what I think the organization was called a Lebensborn where uh, the children were being adopted then or taken kidnapped essentially and and ta taken into German uh, wealthy German homes and uh, of course the war was ending and so there was a uh, that pro probably uh, not as active as as they had been, um, uh, but uh, my mother was still very fearful, and that put me into uh, this hospital where they immediately put me into um, what they called an underground orphanage, mm -hmm. and um, sort of hid me there uh, before um, until the war was ended, and uh, but I couldn't be adopted. Uh, from in, if by any family in Norway because of my heritage, my German and Finnish heritage, because my mother had had um, become quite ill during this time and was not able to get me, you know, return to 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 re retrieve me essentially. Mm -hmm. So I was left by myself. There were two families that wanted to adopt me, and one was a family in South Africa, a doctor and his wife and uh, another family from the United States, the Soderquists, Harold and Bertha. And Tante Marta, who was my, sort of my parent at that time and who I loved more than anyone in the world, she's the one who um, made a decision to send me to the United States. Wow. And she was this large woman who was not terribly beautiful, to look at, but she was the most beautiful woman in the world. And um, I remember at the airport, I sat in her lap and she tried to explain to me what was going to happen. But I just, you know, at five years old or almost five, you can't understand all of that. And uh, I just, I just felt her heart beating and I could hear it. 
And I said, don't ever leave me. And she said she never would. And um, I got on the plane and all by myself. And the, um, the SAS flight attendant um, took care of me. But I, I lost what I called my smeller, which was something that I had put on Tante Marta's face, uh, just a rag. And um, it wasn't there. And I would have used it to hold it and smell it. Mm. And uh, I cried and cried. But then the lovely flight attendant, you know, came up and started talking to me. And and uh, and and when I got off the plane, I thought, well, this is my new parent. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, who am I? Where, you know? Uh, who who is my parent? What what? And and but then Harold and Bertha started walking towards me, and um, my mother told me later that I walked to them like Charlie Chaplin, and you know, as the tramp, and and um, <laughs> and, and it was my way, I think, of of protecting myself, of entertaining. Well, I'm going to be entertaining. They're going to love me. They're going to have to love me because here I am. I'm entertaining them, and. Um, and they they were wonderful. Just let me step you back to the orphanage. What are your memories of being there, Marta? I know when last we spoke, you said there was some moments of terror for you there. Because I was German and the children, half German, and the children found out that I, I was. Um, you know, some of them called me the Nazi child, the Nazi girl, and they would chase me and... Um, and I would hide under beds. and But there was one little girl, Eva, who was a little bit older than I, maybe about four more years older. And um, and I remember she treated me like, <laughs> like her own little baby. And, uh, you know, she'd dress me up and do my hair. And, and uh, but then her father came and got her um, uh, after the war and, um, and, you know, she was gone. So, but you know, it it it's children. That's why my my children's book is about what children need, and that is to be safe. Yes, you're in the throes of writing a children's book that draws on your experiences, orphaned, and then being adopted by this wonderful family uh, in Michigan. Did you bond right away, Marta, when you met your new family? At first, I cried and cried and cried, of course. You know, I was confused. I was hurt. I was lonely. Um, I couldn't speak the language. My father spoke Swedish. My adopted father, Harold Soderquist, I sort of understood that. Um, but my Bertha, my mother, <laughs> my adopted mother, she took out, she put lipstick on my face, on my lips, and she put nail polish on my nails. And so those were my first two American words. Oh, wow. I said nail polish, lipstick, lipstick. Oh. <laughs> And, I can uh, hear the emotion in your voice now, Marta, even these these years on. It's still obviously so fresh and so vivid and obviously something that just, well, it, it brings out those extraordinary emotions. How could it not? Yes, yes. And, um, you know, I see the the orphans or children that have been orphaned in, you know, now in uh, so many different disaster um, events and... I have a feeling of what they're going through. At least I got a family. I always felt loved me unconditionally, trusted. I trusted them and they would have never, ever harmed me. And, um, and, but, and I wasn't alone anymore. You then discovered you had a whole bunch of, of siblings. You had brothers and sisters all around the world, one by one, you begin to discover that you had sisters, you had a brother living in Australia. I mean, this is just extraordinary. The person who brought us together was my was my sister Anneli, Anneli Rusan, and um, Anneli was um, this light in this world. And um, when I was doing Lost in Space, just finishing the third season, I received a telegram from Twentieth Century Fox. 
and in it, in it, it said that um, I'm believe I believe I'm your sister. My name is Anneli Rusanen, and I saw an article that uh, you had uh, given for a Finnish magazine, and um, I believe I believe very much very much that I'm your sister. I asked my mother, our mother, Helmi, and uh, she broke down in tears and uh, said yes, that was the case. And um, that that there are other siblings, and <laughs> Anneli, <laughs> I, I immediately, of course, contacted Anneli immediately, and I said we must. My, I'm going to bring my parents, uh, and uh, and we're all going to come to Finland. The three of us are going to come to Finland, and uh, we're going to uh, we're going to meet you. And uh, and by then I was married, and. Uh, and then a few months later, found out I was pregnant. So I went. I went to Finland with my parents, and um, and we met Anneli. We met Helmi, my birth mother, and wonderful brothers and sisters. I didn't meet Seppo at the time, and and I didn't meet uh, uh, another uh, sister Margit and another sister Lena. But um, Anneli kept finding, kept finding <laughs> brothers. And sisters. How many all wanted... up do you think, Marta? How many brothers? <laughs> there still could be more, you know, that Anneli and I kept saying that, you know, we kept teasing each other. She said, I know there's a dozen. I know there's a dozen. <laughs> but um, there were 10 of us. And um, Wow. What was yeah. it like for your adoptive parents who were your parents now living in America and you traveled with them to Finland? What was that feeling like? It was strange, I have to tell you. We um we went there and I and I was sort of um closed off, I think. I I I didn't want to have all the feelings that I felt. And um and Bertha my Bertha Soderquist, my my beautiful birth or adopted mother, she was the one who cried for all of us. <laughs> you I know? It wasn't until later that I began to feel the deep emotion of um, loss, of of um, reliving the the years that I was without a parent, and um, and the feelings of abandonment. And, um, you know, what a child feels like when uh, they don't, when they're alone, completely alone. And um, so, you know, I, I didn't want to be angry. I, I actually forgave her. I sat down and had Anneli tell her uh, she was our interpreter, because Anneli spoke five different languages. She was amazing. But I said... Um, I told my birth mother, Helmi, that I forgave her. Well, she was he... fearful you'd be killed. I mean, that was the reason for it, wasn't it? That was yes. the reason you understood. What was it like when you met your brother? And this was in the 90s now, so we're moving forward quite some time. Yes. You meet your brother, Seppo, in Australia. What was that moment like, that first moment when your eyes met and you wrapped your arms around one another? It was pure and utter joy. I mean, Seppo is just this interesting, funny, smart person. And I don't think he's, you know, very open in terms of his emotion, but we both were so happy to see each other. And we just held each other and, and laughed and, and looked at each other and studied each other. And um, it was, it was it was just wonderful, uh, and and then meeting his beautiful wife Pivy and and the, and his daughter Lena and uh, and son Samuel and staying with them and uh, Kevin and I uh, staying in with them in their house and and getting to know them and Seppo and Seppo and I, I I'm I'm a hiker and Seppo knew that and so we took off one day just the two of us into the bush and Seppo created this whole path for us by 
you know, I, he didn't have a machete, but he just had a, you know, sticks and we're, you know, moving it aside. And I'm thinking, does he know where we're going? But he knew exactly where he was going. He even created a walking stick for me. Oh. And I, I'll never, ever forget that. And, and there was a stream below us. And that's where he was taking me. And we sat on a big rock next to the stream and we talked and talked and talked. And it was, it was one of the best best moments of my life. It um, was just an, a beautiful, beautiful experience. It was one of those things I'm guessing that was meant to be. Now, is this true? I mean, speaking of astounding journeys too, uh, you getting into showbiz, you were discovered of all things, eating spaghetti at a deli in Los Angeles. Is that right? Yes, I should have been eating uh, rye on, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah brisket or corned beef on, 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 on rye, but instead I was eating spaghetti yeah. you know, and um, saw a few men watching me and I, you know, didn't think much about it, but I was, you know, sort of went, oh, <laughs> you, you can't help but notice. And so one of the men came over to me and introduced himself and said he was uh, James Harris, the producer. He's a, He was a producer and he was producing a movie with Stanley Kubrick called... Lolita. Mm -hmm. And that uh, he asked if I was interested in acting. And I said I had never been interested in, in anything else, which was the truth. And um, he, uh, he said, well, I would like to meet your parents. And I would like you to read the book. And I would like them to read the book. And um, I said, oh, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And so he came, we read the book. I was 15 at the time. And um, my parents said, no, no, uh, that's not what we want for her. We, re we realized she wants to be an actor. And, you know, if, if you have any other suggestions for her, that would be great. Uh, we would uh, love to hear about it. But they understood that uh, film would be, I was in Hollywood, film would be the place where I would probably well, where I would want to end up, but that was not the that was not the vehicle that they wanted me to be in. It was um, I loved the book. I thought it was amazing. Mm. I so much wanted to be uh, Lolita. Um, uh, I, I felt I could have could have easily have just sort of slipped into the part, and and um, but no, they said no. A Sue but, Lyon, I think, got the role of Lolita. Sue Lyon, yes. And, and think about great. that wonderful cast too, Marta. There was Shelley Winters and there was James Mason. I bet in a in a kind of spooky way you kick yourself that your parents said, no, you can't do that. That's not the movie for you. And I understand, you know, they were protecting me. And, uh, and, I, and I think they just didn't want me to have my head in that kind of of uh of mindset yes. and um and i understand that i understand you know they were as i said they were protecting me and uh, they assumed that i would go back to michigan and and uh, finish my schooling there because my original thought was to go to new york city because i loved theater so much what happened was that james harris he was impressed enough with me to get me a very very good agent lillian small and she was she took me under her wing and I started working immediately. And I became the, the ingenue that people called uh, for when they wanted someone to, someone of my, of my ilk to, uh, to yes. do a part. Now, Savage Sam, I think, was your movie debut and that was a Disney film. And I yes. read some story somewhere, Marta, tell me if this is true, that when you and your mum were meeting Walt Disney, you were eating a bit of bread and got so excited you nearly choked on it. Is that right? Yes, I had just taken a piece of bread when he asked me uh, a, a question and I I started choking on it and my face got bright red and the tears were coming and my mother's beating me on the back. But while she's doing that, while she's patting me on the back, I, she's answering the question. <laughs> and uh, oh, thank God for mom. But Mr. Disney was very amused by it, I could see. And 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 I maybe that's what sold him on me. I don't know. Now, in your early, early Hollywood days, uh, you were part of the Loretta Young show. Of course, she an amazing movie star who then made that uh, that move to television and her show was enormously popular. What was the Loretta Young that you got to know like? Well, I didn't get to know her on the show because I was part of an anthology where I played 
of all things, both of my parents were alcoholics and it was an AA meeting. So I had a long monologue in it. But I later on dated Mark Montalban's son. And uh, his aunt was Loretta Young. So we would go to dinners at her house. And she was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. Um, even in her, I, she must have been in her 60s at the time or 70s, which I now consider young. And uh, I was just so taken by her grace. And there was just something so lovely and I mean, really stunningly beautiful and soft-spoken and um, and just a, a very, um, I, I think a very self-contained, but very self-assured and very, as I said, very graceful woman. And uh, I I've always thought, oh, I would love, I hope I get there. I hope I do that. I hope I'm like that. Although my mother was like that too. So I have good, I had a great, uh, uh, person to to take after and then of course the great sir alfred hitchcock you got to appear in several episodes of alfred hitchcock presents and spookily with bill moomy whom you would later go on to work with of course in lost in space what was alfred hitchcock like was he a little intimidating oh he was very intimidating he was just a, 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 a you know one of the great directors of all time. And uh, he really could get under your skin. And in a way, he sort of did that with me. I, I just sort of, he looked over at me once and I, you know, I was like terrified. <laughs> and um, and I said, oh, and I looked away. Oh, he's looking at me. He's looking at me. He's looking at me. Don't know. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I, of course, I did my job and and it went well there were you know just a couple of takes and that was fine and and um uh but bill at one time at one point while mr hitchcock was sitting in his chair you know he was like seven years old and he's moving around like this and mr hitchcock went to him like this and he said you know i'm good to, I, I want to say something in your ear and i saw bill i, I was i saw billy's eyes just like it was huge, and he stood stark still. And later on, I asked him, "What did he say to you?" And he said, "He told me that uh, if, if I didn't stand still, he would nail my feet to the ground." <laughs> Which, as a seven-year-old, would be a terrifying prospect, and terrifying. especially the great Sir Alfred Hitchcock's almost stentorian voice, which in itself was quite fear making wasn't it yes oh oh my god it was great it was great and I, I, billy does tell the story and and i uh, and uh, and with great glee he tells the story he's past the fear of course but uh <laughs> i could see the fear i saw I the bet fear you could but but there is another wonderful movie memory i'd like to uh, i'd like to bring you to and that is beach blanket bingo with frankie avalon and sadly the late great Annette Funicello I mean that woman was just pure sunshine wasn't she such a a really sad end for Annette Funicello with multiple sclerosis but you played a mermaid in Beach Blanket Bingo I did play a mermaid but I do want to say about Annette that was my husband's my, my husband Kevin's crush great crush as a young man or as a child I, I guess a kid uh, uh he just loved Annette and I said it was always because she had big breasts and he said no <laughs> no that's not why she's very talented and I said yeah uh, <laughs> but uh yeah <laughs> uh no she she was lovely and and easy to work with and and um she and frankie didn't come on the set very often until they were absolutely needed uh because they had had a long long um a career by then uh, you know and even in their late teens and early 20s uh yeah you know, being a part of the show business and 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 uh, having people coming after them and and you know wanting so much from them and so i think uh, they they decided just to sort of you know, keep separate from the rest of the group. And and that was fine. Um, uh, playing the mermaid was so much fun. I um, <laughs> I had to wear this very heavy tail at times and uh, only when I was in the water. And, and um, uh, but it was, you know, 
Hans Christian Andersen wrote about Lorelei, and, and uh, so I, I felt that I was continuing the Scandinavian uh, legacy of, uh, of, of of mermaids and Hans Christian Andersen, and uh, it was uh, it was a, a sweet. There was something sweet about it, and th th the beach party movies were, you know, sort of the a way to get away from all of the things that were happening, not unlike Lost in Space, actually. Yeah, they but, were wonderful, well, weren't they? It was a certain time and a place, mm -hmm. and they brought such a joy to so many people around the world, didn't they, those yes. beach movies? Yes, and the dancing and the singing and the and just the, the, the silliness of it and um, the sweetness of my story of the mermaid and Lorelai and wanting to have legs, yearning to have legs, and then being given that opportunity for a very short time and falling in love and, uh, you know, having that whole cycle of, uh, of life, uh, you know, happening within a very short period of time. Now, Marta, I read somewhere that for Beach Blanket Bingo, you, of course, playing the mermaid, one scene was shot in a warm tank, but the rest was shot in the ocean, which for anybody who's ever been in those uh, chilly California waters, they know it's, uh, it's like an iceberg. It was November and the water was freezing because the Pacific here is not that warm. And <laughs> the director, uh, wonderful William Asher, uh, had a megaphone and uh, he would yell at me from, from, you know, from the land, smile, smile. <laughs> and I was like freezing. <laughs> and um, I, there, there was a man behind me, behind the rocks. And uh, they were, uh, he, I knew he was there. But there was a heavy surge and it would like take me near the rocks and then take me away. And now I'm a very good swimmer. And I, that's probably one of the reasons why they chose me for the part. But um, uh, uh, but th that was that was a little terrifying. And it, the water was was deep. And um, but I, you know, and I'm trying to trying to keep my shoulders above um, above the water so that I, you know, so that they would show. Yes, and, you could show uh, off your fabulous assets. My assets, woo! <laughs> yeah, my, my shoulder assets. They didn't want to see anything else, but uh, because I just had like pasties on, which yeah. fell off, of course, and um, in the water. But uh, uh, I, that was that was quite an experience. And, it, and um, the, the odd part was that everybody got colds except for me. <laughs> Me, uh, they all, you know, the virus just sort of spread through the whole whole uh, crew and cast. But I, I was fine, probably because I was I had gotten so cold. The virus said, "Nope, not going there." <laughs> That's right. Nineteen sixty-five. Your life will change forever because onto our TV screens right round the world burst Lost in Space, the original Lost in Space. Of course, you were to play the role of uh, Judy Robinson, the eldest daughter. But it was a role, Marta, that originally you turned down. You didn't want to do it, did you? No, I didn't, because um, my ambitions, again, were to go uh, do theatre, you know, theatre, theatre, theatre. And, um, and I had been doing all the shows on television uh, uh, as a you know, and some very serious work and some great character work. I really hadn't envisioned myself doing something that would be weekly and a part of a, a large cast, because uh, it was a large cast, and and playing a character that I really wasn't sure would have any meat to mm -hmm. it. And, um, you know, I, I really, I really considered myself, uh, and I still do, um, uh, an actor with a lot of skills and um, uh, a skill set that I didn't think would be um, would be utilized on 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 the show, and so Irwin Allen, when I met him, uh, loved me. Loved. I think it's because I was wearing huge huge earrings and a bright pink suit, and uh, I, I don't know. It just sort of answered uh, his. Uh, love of of that kind of that kind of uh color and and um and you know br you know something shiny and anyway uh and he and but he also saw my the work that I had done on quite a few shows and they were testing women young women during that time and um uh I didn't test 
he just said, I want that girl with the earrings. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I said, no, no, no. I, you know, let, you know, I don't want to, but uh, my agents kept calling and Irwin called me multiple times. He was very persistent. He was very persistent. And after, I think it was like two weeks, I finally said, all right, but you have to, uh, during that time, I'd say, well, you know, what are what are my storylines? What what do you see of see me as a character? And he was saying, well, you're an actress, and and you your your um, your ambition had been to be on stage. And I said, well, but I'm going to space. And he said, oh yes, we're going to have you, you know, resurrect all of the you know things that you were doing uh, in on land, and you know, Lady Macbeth or whatever. And he said, and you're going to have a love interest and, you know, we'll, we'll develop that. And this is an opportunity, Marta, for you to shine. And uh, and he didn't, I don't think he meant the space suits. No, but, the silver no, space suit, yes. And my husband uh, at the time, Terry, uh, he said, you've got to do it, you've got to do it, you've got to do it. And, and um, I finally, I said, all right, I will. And oh my God, the day I drove into 20th Century Fox and I walked on that set with all the lights flashing, all the light panels, all the people moving around. It was like a you know multi-million dollar movie set. And I said, okay, now I get it. Now I get it. And uh, then of course I was introduced to the cast and we all just, immediately got along like Angela and Bill were my brother and sister for three years and 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 afterward and June and Guy they were just they were lovely and Mark of course I immediately had a crush on him nothing ever came of it but of course because I was married and he was married but um and we honored that but I, uh, but he was so adorable and funny and um I, I just had the the best it was a, just a great experience most of the time. It was long yeah. hours, very yeah. long hours. It's interesting and you talk about you You and Mark developed a kind of crush on one another. Of course, it didn't go anywhere, as you say, you were both married. But you can see that, Marta. I mean, you know, he, of course, was Major Don West who piloted the Jupiter too. But you two had the most incredible, I think they call it crackling chemistry. You just had this this it factor on screen. It intrigues me that that romance thing wasn't explored a little more in Lost in Space. Was there a reason for that? The reason was that it was, um, it came from CBS that uh, there was to be no kissing, no touching uh, uh, with the mother and father or myself and Mark because it was a children's show. And they uh, decided that that would not be appropriate. And I, you know, I disagreed with that because I thought children don't mind that. They wanted, they wanted a little bit of, you know, the romance. You know, it was in the 60s and everything was censored then anyway. I, I think that it would have been nice to have Judy and Don develop uh, a, a romance and a sweet one, you know, oh. something that would have um it know, just enhances you can... your characters and it just it brings it just brings a little more honesty and integrity to what those two characters were about i read yeah. somewhere there were plans for a lost in space spin-off that would have been with you and mark as don and judy getting married just your life after the jupiter 2 perhaps was there any substance to that talk there was talk about something like that um but um Irwin Allen just, uh, uh, he was so busy with other projects that um, he, he didn't want to, he didn't, he didn't want anything to do with it. So uh, it would have been fun. It would have been, a, it would have been wonderful. And I think it would have been with uh, Mark and myself and uh, Will and, uh, or Angela and Bill. June and Guy were sort of done with the show. Um, and I'm not sure how the public would have would have accepted that, but um, it would have been interesting. I think it would have would have been a. Um, I think it would have been a terrific show. 
Tell me this. Are you still in touch with Mark Goddard and how is he? Well, Mark is uh, uh, recovering from um, some issues that he's had from hip surgery and, uh, and, and double pneumonia. So prayers out to him um, every day to until he uh, gets better. And um, he's strong. He's tough. And he's got a, a wife and family that love him, that will carry him through this. He's on and the East Coast, isn't he, I think? He's on the East Coast. He's in, in uh, Massachusetts, yes. Now, um, Jonathan Harris, of course, as Dr. Zachary Smith, is this true that he modelled that voice on a combination of Clifton Webb, a wonderful old Broadway grand dame, Martita Hunt? Exactly. That's how she talked. <laughs> Jonathan was a self-made man. He, was, he had grown up very poor and... Um, he had even studied pharmacology, became a pharmacist for a while, and uh, his his parents uh, rented out his his bedroom, uh, and uh, he would sleep on the dining room table, and um, uh, that was his bed for most of his his youth. And um, uh, he he'd often talked about that, and and he and his wife Gertrude met in high school. He taught me so much about about how to work as an ensemble, to be a part of an ensemble. Um, I, that's not taught enough, I think, in, in, uh, in the business to young people nowadays. Jonathan was a just a truly gifted, not only actor, but a gifted human being. He understood, you know, how to make a set something that was unified and, and where you could tell jokes and laugh in between takes, and never get uh, angry at other at anyone, um, and have nicknames for people, and uh, uh, you know, and 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 he would and he would take me aside and say, "See, Marta, this is what you do. This is how you behave." And I say, "Yes, you're absolutely right." And of course, I had been taught that by my parents, so that was an education that uh, no class could could teach me. He was just amazing. And on top of it all, he was always prepared. Marty, you said that Jonathan gave everyone in the cast nicknames. So what was yours? The Viking Princess. Oh, of course. Of course. <laughs> of course. Is this true, Marty? He kind of had carte blanche with being able to rewrite his scripts and basically do what he wanted to do. Well, the alliterations were something that he became famous for. Battling cars, mental midget, blithering bumpkin. There, he would get letters from uh, teachers. The, the teachers would say, I would write down all the alliterations and then ask the children, what do you think this meant? What, what does this mean? And uh, it, I, that made him so happy. Uh, and Gertrude was a perfect partner for him. Oh, my goodness. She... I don't know if you know this, but she um, she was one of the top, with the first female executives at Max Factor. Yes, an and incredibly they strong-willed, wonderfully yes. charismatic woman, and they bounced off one another, didn't they? Yes, but you know, we he kept her his private life very separate from from work, and it wasn't until after Lost in Space that we got to know her and uh, going to parties there to dinner parties and and um and meeting gertrude and 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 uh and gertrude had a very similar persona as as um uh, jonathan she she was quite she was very elegant very elegant very bright red hair sort of my style and 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 just uh just a beautiful, beautiful woman, uh, and 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 extremely intelligent. And um, I could see how Jonathan and she were perfect partners for each other. Jonathan, of course, left us um, what twenty one years ago. I remember Bill Moomy telling me that Jonathan was really like a mentor to Bill, and that Bill feels Jonathan very much around him. It's kind of like his spirit is there. Does that happen to you? Do you sometimes feel Jonathan Harris around you? I feel him in terms of what he's taught me. Our last contact, we were at a convention and I had done a commercial. He put his arm around me and the commercial was 
it ran for three years and it was for Advil. And I used to say, oh, I should have said, oh, the pain, the pain. But uh, <laughs> he put his arm around me and, and he said, Marta, that was the best commercial I've ever seen. And he said, it was so lovely. You were so quiet and so relaxed. And he said, it just, it was perfect. And I, you know, I, I told him at that time how much that meant to me that I, I couldn't believe that I would get that from someone that I admired so much and and throughout the years. And, uh, and, and it was such a gentle, beautiful encounter with him. And um, I, I, you know, and I carry that with me. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill, of course, had a, a much uh, a stronger relationship with him because of, you know, the nature of their their um, parts in the show and um, all the scenes that they did. So I can understand how Bill would feel that way. I kept in touch with Gertrude after Jonathan passed. When she passed, I got her dog, their dog. Yes, little Zachary. Now, how yeah. is June Lockhart doing? Because she's well into her 90s now, isn't she? And she was the quintessential TV mum beyond her movie career. But then you remember her as the mum from Lassie and, of course, the mum in Lost in Space. What was the June like you got to know? She had a wild side that no one would believe. Uh, she, um, she, on Fridays... She she would bring her whatever she was going to wear out, and it was usually things like a uh, crocheted um, uh, bell bottoms. I mean, it, and uh, with a crocheted top to match in green and pinks, and and uh, she would be going out to some rock concert somewhere, and uh, she would uh, uh, we, we would all be like, uh, what? Uh, because she she was completely different her hair would be down and it was quite long and and uh uh and it was you know she she would be just dancing around the set and um uh, that was the real the real june i mean i remember years and years ago she told me she was a huge david bowie fan and even kept a picture of david bowie in her purse and when he passed uh, I could see that it made a huge difference in her in her life. The last time I spoke with her, she was no longer doing conventions. Um, and I think she just wanted to have some peace, you know. she's uh, she says she sits and she reads. She's a huge reader, a great intellectual. And um she said she just enjoys looking out the window and uh, sitting and looking at the birds and uh, and it's just as, uh, enjoying her her later years without having to get dressed up and she's happy. We were just talking before about the fact that you were reluctant to sign on for Lost in Space because you felt you'd just be floating around in a silver suit and it really wouldn't have much meat to it and then Irwin Allen rejigged those scripts and gave you a whole bunch of meaty stuff and a romance and all of that. I remember an episode, Attack of the Monster Plants, where you got to play almost like an evil copy of yourself. Now, that must have been fun. It was so much fun, um, <clears throat> especially the line where I, you know, come late to dinner. Maureen, mother, asks, "Would you, uh, Judy, would you like some salad? And I say, no, I don't want any salad, <laughs> obviously, because I'm a plant. And um, it's always fun to play a character that has some issues and problems. And um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. It gave me an opportunity to do something that I hadn't done before on the show. And uh, it was, it really was fun. And uh, although they never... The problem with the show was that ne they never resolved what happened to the copy of Judy. And no, where did she go? What happened to her? Why did Lost in Space end when it did? It went for three seasons. It is in constant repeat all around the world all the time, as you know. Why did it end when it did? Irwin didn't have all the stories that lined up for the uh, president of CBS. The head of CBS made the call, then we're not going to renew you when uh, if you don't, if you're not going to give me the stories, you know, which was 
alarming to us because we all assumed we were coming back for another year mm -hmm. and all wanted to, of course. Uh, we were, I was hoping that Mark and I would have a, you know, begin to start having a relationship maybe this time. And, uh, and, but maybe everyone didn't, you know, didn't want to battle um, the networks and didn't want to. Um, and I think June and Guy were somewhat unhappy because they were, you know, they were both stars. They were, you know, Guy had been in in Zorro and oh, and heck yes. We became sort of um, a second string to uh, to to Jonathan and the robot and Bill, and uh, I, I wasn't unhappy about it. I I figured I could go to Irwin again and talk to him. <laughs> I, Mark always had a a funny story he would tell about about me, and it it was sort of true. That I, w I went up to Irwin, I, that I went to his office once and said, Irwin, you've got to give me more to do. You've got to give me more to do. Because this week I only go, I'm saying, uh, going down the ramp of the spaceship going, will? Irwin said, yes, yes, of course, we'll give you more. So the next week I go, I walk down the ramp and I go, will? Penny? Done. <laughs> Anyway, uh, well, I mean, I, he kept his promise, didn't he? he? Gave you more. He gave you a penny. It sort of was true. I was a little bit, I was a little bit um, unhappy, but I, but as always, I was uh, op optimistic that things would get better. But it is what it is. I remember Jonathan Harris telling me years ago. You've just brought it back to my mind now. That one sadness he had with Lost in Space was that he and Guy Williams didn't see eye to eye. And I think that you've just maybe answered it there, Marta, because it did become a bit of the Jonathan and Bill Moomy show, and totally understandably, and they had such a dynamic. But I think that when Guy Williams signed on, as you say, he was a very big star. He'd come from playing Zorro. He'd been a, a movie heartthrob. And I think that he felt that he was supposed to be kind of the star of the show. And then within minutes, Jonathan Harris does. And I do remember Jonathan saying, oh, dear boy, Craig, one of the things that, you know, did upset me a little is, you know, I I was always nice to everybody, but Guy kind of took him the wrong way. Are those your observations when you look back on it? Yes. And um, and and Jonathan indeed was, uh, you know, wonderful to everyone. But um, uh, there were times when June and Guy would become very unhappy with um uh, some machinations going on around, you know, maybe the the new director wanted to film, you know, below so that it wasn't terribly attractive, you know, a, a low camera angle. And um, and I remember one time they walked off the the set and um, I, I was stunned, I, I, I alarmed that they did that. And um, but at the time, I think that they were beginning to feel as if they had uh, 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 had not been um, uh, that they had been discarded to some degree, and uh, because Jonathan and Bill and the robot, you know, the, I think my personal opinion is that the first year is is really better than the the other two um, than the, the next two years because um they because they had they had they they were more like twilight zone and and um and and uh, uh the outer limits they they were more mysterious they were black and white too so that makes a difference when when you look at something black and white it has a whole statement in, in itself so to do everything around the robot and uh, and and uh, Jonathan, Dr. Smith and 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 Will, um, it, it changed the whole tenor of of the family of of the of the um, feeling of what the show was really about, and that was you know an adventure series for about a family in space, and uh, which which was all there in the beginning. It changed. Um, where myself and Mark and and Guy and June were sort of put in the in the background, and and that was painful. It was it's painful as an artist to uh, to have thought that you were hired for one thing and then uh, 
then something else happens and 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 your second as i said earlier second string guy williams he died so young marta and i know that you you were quite close and he died i think where was it down in argentina or somewhere yes yes what what happened i uh, well he had a, had had a stroke mm. um and and uh 6 months prior to his death and he had come back to Los Angeles and we had done family feud and, and we were all a little worried um, whether he could remember things or whether he would have problems, you know, talking, but he didn't. He was wonderful. And we all felt very relieved and felt that he was back, you know, and uh, then he went back to Argentina and apparently he uh, he passed um, uh, and wasn't found for for a couple of days. Um and uh, but he was by himself, and uh, we were all so sad that we had lost a friend and uh, and such an, a wonderful man. He there, there was such a gentlemanliness, gentlemanliness about him. He he um, loved great music, classical music, and there was always classical music playing in his dressing room, and um, oh, and 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 he was elegant and. Uh, uh, and his wife too was just beautiful, and and his children now I know them and Tony and Steve and and or Guy Junior and and uh, they're just uh, yeah they're so similar to to their father. I mean, speaking of beautiful, you married the love of your life uh, in the seventies, Kevin Kane, a, a lawyer, and I think you were together, Marta, something like forty two years before. Yeah his passing in 2016, knowing that was such a great love for you, how do you cope with such a crushing grief? It's a matter of, well, I'll tell you a story about my father and myself. Um, when I, my first husband and I separated, I was devastated. And uh, my parents came to help me because I had a, a daughter. I couldn't stop crying. I couldn't stop crying. And at one point, my father reached out to me. And, and he was not a, a you know, a touchy-feely kind of person. And, and, and But he gently put his hand on my hand. And he said, Marta, I think it's time that you think outside of yourself. And he meant it in a very kind way. And that was that he, he was telling me that my heart, even though it's broken, you has to, you have to look outside. You have to look beyond these blinders that you're living in. And um, I, even though with Kevin, who was, as you said, the love of my life, the great love of my life. And I talk to him all the time. He, I feel him with me all the time. I dream about him. I know he visits me. Uh, I know he directs me, guides me throughout my life. And, um, but he would want me to do the same thing that my father told me, and that is to reach out to others. And like the conventions, I love people. I love to talk to people. I love to find out who they are and who their families are and their about their children, about their lives, where they live, how they how they cope in their lives. And people open up to me. And I feel that we're all a part of one and that um, I know I'll see Kevin again. There's no doubt in my mind. No doubt at all. And in a spooky way, you've just hit on something there, Marta. And I see why you so love the conventions and you so appreciate the fans, because in a way, it is like a big family, isn't it? They're like your brothers and sisters and nephews and cousins and uncles and aunts. And so you you interact in that kind of almost family way that does bring comfort, doesn't it? It does. I always come back feeling so loved and so full of that love. And um, I, I hope that I give that out to the people who come to 
to talk with me and to see me. And, and some are very nervous, some are curious. Uh, and I, I just I just try and and make them a part of my life because they're, you know, they feel that when they come to see me that I was a part of their lives. And I've made so many good friends, mm -hmm. good, close friends. Um, well, not uh, so many, but but some, and uh, and they'll be my friends for the rest of my life, and uh, and I love them, and uh, and they help me, they help me through my through this difficult difficult time. I I have to you know I miss Kevin every single moment of my my life, and um, and I always will. We but I'm part... sensing your dogs are a great comfort too, Marta. Would that be right? I have one dog right now, but I often have my daughter's dogs and um, my dog, Molly. She's an old girl. She's 12 now. Kevin picked her out. Uh -oh. She's a, uh, yeah, she's a multi rescue, multi food rescues, rescues, rescues. Yes. They're the best. Yeah. Yep, I've always right had rescues. I had one rescue that was used for bait for fighting and he was nine and I couldn't let him near anybody other than the family. But, um, I gave him some good years and he died at my feet all by himself. He just, I, I had called the vet and the vet was going to come, but instead he laid at my feet and died. And, um, you know, I, I, I dogs and cats and I had a cat for 21 years, Siddhartha. <laughs> I, I gave him a very difficult name to live up to. Uh, <laughs> Didn't you? What? And of course, you had yes. Jonathan's um, dog. Zachary. Yeah, Zachary. Zachary. That's right. Of he course. died of a heart attack. He had an enlarged heart, and he died of a heart attack one night. And I held him, and um, I, he was right next to me. And he had the heart attack. Um, but oh, I, we gave him some good years, and uh, he hiked every day. He had never been taken out. I think. And I hiked with him every day. I, I hope I didn't kill him. I, I often think, I often worry about that. And maybe I walked him too far. Oh, too much. wow. But, now, look, as we speak, Marta, uh, there is the, 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 the writer's strike, of course, has brought Hollywood, in inverted commas, to a standstill. Um, but before then, you had a whole lot of movie projects that were in the, on the drawing board, in the brew. Um, you're busy as can be. You're writing that children's book uh, about your life and the messages that you've learned along the way. Um, so there's still a lot happening with you at this point in time, right? Yes. Um, of course, I, I take classes. I continue to take classes. I've always, oh, I tell, I tell every actor, take classes or get into community theater, always do, do, do something. And so I take dance classes, I take um, acting classes. I have some of the greatest teachers, the Ruskin Theater. Uh, they want me to direct. I, I'm going to, I'm going to dip my toe into that um, pretty soon, but I'm also, um, uh, uh, there are plans for Vernon Wells, Oh, who is my wonderful neighbor and good, good friend. And an um, Australian to boot. And an Australian. He was just in Australia. And uh, Vernon and I ha did a movie together called A Bachelor's Valentine. And um, uh, the writer and director of that movie, I uh, have written a script for Vernon and myself called Remnants about a couple who've been married 50 years and how 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 do you navigate those later years together and um and how um how do you keep keep that romance or that 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 uh, uh in tune alive and um and and uh so it it's a really really good script and the writer who knows Vernon and myself quite well has sort of written our own history into it so uh, uh, it's it's a beautifully written script, and um, I, I can't wait to work on that. And then there's another one called The Ghost Light, where I play a woman, an older woman, who um, ha has started a theater in a very small town in the Midwest, and um, and she she loved it as a as a young woman, 
and now is going to be sold by her uh, her grand grand uh, grandson and and uh, and they're coming to her to tell her please don't do that let's let's keep it going and a, an actress from Hollywood comes in and and decides to take it over anyway it's it's uh it's it's such a wonderful part for me and and uh it uh it's a smaller part but it's but it's full of 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 longing and 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 love and um caring as remnants is so i'm excited i'm i'm really excited Oh, well, if you're all. excited, I'm excited. Now all of your fans are excited. We'd need more of Marta Kristen on the big screen or the small <laughs> screen or the stage or anywhere, because i got to say, you really are just the most beautiful woman I knew. Right away when we met, I think it was back in May in Los Angeles, I thought, gee, there is just something extra special about you, not just your astonishing story, but, and I'm ever so grateful that you've shared it today, but just you, there's something really gorgeous and very, very special about you. Thank you, Marta, so much for having a chat with me. And you have a website too. So if your fans want to keep up with all the things that you are doing uh, or have a look at some of the fabulous things that you have done, that is martakristen.com. I'm also, of course, on Facebook and Instagram and you know, all of them. Oh, you're everywhere, aren't you? You're I'm everywhere. Oh, Craig, this has just been such an amazing discussion. And thank you. Thank you for asking such perfect questions. And, and um, oh, I just, I so appreciate, so appreciate talking with you. And again, thank you so much. I just adore you. I adore you. Kelly, thank you. And it's so nice to meet you. Take care. <laughs> <laughs>